So the next part is about gene ontology. Um, when you have differential gene expression, people are interested in knowing what those genes are, but imagine reporting this in a paper with a list of gene names. As we mentioned, people are comfortable with seeing 300 genes that are different. You know, if you have a paper and you say, ah, after we did this experiment comparing cancer and normal, we see the following 300 genes as different, and you list the whole 300 genes in the paper, it will be kind of very difficult to understand or kind of boring, right? And so people want to say something about those genes. Do they have certain functions? Are they enriched in some, some pathways or, or something like that? Yeah, so how do you report the differentially expressed genes or, or a group of genes, right? Are they enriched in pathways? Are they enriched in some functions? Are those genes or proteins localized in the, some complex? Are they all in the nucleus? Are they, you know, are they all enriched in, in something? And so that means you need to give a gene some kind of annotation. Um, the, 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 the motivation of this really stem from people starting to look at how genes are named. Um, years ago, when people are just still, we, we don't have the human genome or whatever species whole genome yet. Um, every scientist who discovered a new gene are free to name their gene with, they can name the gene themselves. That, that's kind of an honor. It's like when you find a new star, you can name it whatever you want. And so people who discover new genes can name it. And uh, very often they give it some interesting genes, uh, uh, gene names based on a particular phenotype. They say, ah, this gene is related to a fly having white eye or some strange wings or a wrinkle pea, right? So they can name the genes some crazy names. Uh, but then after a while, this name will go a bit crazy in the field because in different species, even in the same species, our genes are named quite differently. And so um, a consortium of biologists got together to say, we need to really be consistent and try to um, annotate the genes better uh, just so that later on we can understand what that gene is doing, especially if you use a model organism like human, uh, sorry, like um, cell lines or, 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 or organisms such as a fly or a worm or a mouse, you understand that that fly gene is roughly the same as a human gene if you annotate them correctly. Um, yeah, so the, the reason we care is that this way you can effectively communicate biological knowledge you can also organize and summarize these annotations in a better structured way. And the most important thing is you can allow effective and meaningful computation on the gene annotations. Um, so after you got the 300 genes, if each gene is annotated with a code, at the end you can look at all of this code and say, ah, all of these genes are related to certain pathways or certain functions. And so based on this, the Gene Ontology Consortium decided to uh, divide the, the, or the, to annotate the genes in the following way. Every gene is given three terms. One of the terms is to annotate the molecular function of the gene. What is this gene's job or abilities, right? So you can have transporters or transcription factors. So, you know, you roughly say what this gene does. The second code or annotation for this gene is biological process, which says what kind of event, what kind of pathways does this gene participate in? Um, these are things like uh, cell differentiation, maturation, development, or um, yeah, metabolism or, or something. There are some pathways or, in here. And the third, annotation for each gene is a cellular component which describes the location of this gene after it's made into a protein because when it's a DNA it's always in the nucleus but maybe um, after the protein is made they go to a specific uh, subcellular structure or is part of a macromolecular complex. Um, these are things like uh, this, this protein is in the nucleus, it's on the cell membrane, it's in the mitochondria or in, in, in different uh, proteasome and, and so on. And so every gene is given these three terms. 
But within each term, you can see here, um, if you go to the gene ontology website, they will show you something like this. Uh, initially, you have everything, uh, which have 183,000 different terms. And if you open this, by the way, if you see a little plus, it means if you click on it, it can open up. And so if you click on this, uh, the all, it will open up three things. One is the biological process, one is the cellular component, and one is the molecular function. But if we open the biological process, you can see here, it's a, uh, there are more items in here. For biological process, there's behavior, unknown process, cellular process development, physiological process, regulation of biological process, and uh, viral life cycle. Okay, and if we were to click the viral life cycle, it will go to even more terms, right? So basically, um, you can analyze. So this this is a tree. Initially, in the in the tree, you have all that's kind of the bulk of the branch, the, the 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 stem of the tree. And then when it first starts to branch, there are three different branches. One is the biological process, one is the cellular component, one is the molecular function. Then the tree has three branches, and each branch will continue to branch out, and you will have more and more specific annotation. For example, if we look at a viral life cycle, there is the latent virus infection. There is the viral spread within host. So you can see it really gets much, much more um, specific and uh, each of them it tell you so you can see here um, it has a, a number that's the gene ontology code that's the number that people or computers use to do computations um, and also th these numbers tell you how many terms are underneath this big family of terms and so as you blow up more and more of those plus signs uh, the branch will see you will see more and more smaller branches and each branch will have fewer terms and eventually there might be very few then see the, the end of the, the the annotation and so um you you might also notice there is this i and also the p this indicates the relationship between the parent node and the child node on, on this tree and the, the most common relationship is p and i um, so the I means uh, something is uh, is A. Um, for example, five prime UTR is uh, part of a sorry. The P means part of. So five prime UTR is part of a transcript. Uh, or you can say um, in the protein complex, one gene is part of the complex, another gene is part of the complex, third is another part of a complex, right? Whereas um, uh, is, that's the part of is a um, so for example mRNA is kind of a transcript right it's one type of transcript a tRNA is another kind of transcript uh, RNA is another kind of transcript and so the is a uh, is another relationship that denotes a more specific thing for the, the general class right so um, for example cellular morphogenesis during differentiation is a more specific is a, a more specific kind of cell development um, whereas uh, cell development is part of cell differentiation yeah so basically that denotes you know the relationship um, also actually um, the same term could be annotated at multiple branches sometimes say transcription factor it, you can see that or, or transcription regulation can sometimes go to both the, um, the biological process or the, cell, the, the, the molecular function. So you can see here, um, if you look at the three branches, the biological process have uh, 111,000, uh, cellular components have, yeah, each of them has about 11, uh, sorry, 110,000. And if you were to add these three together, you should expect 300,000 different no, uh, total terms, but then the, the, the total term is just only 183,000, which means there are some terms that will appear in multiple branches. But um, the Gene Ontology Consortium made sure that there is no cycles, which means 
one one term is the parent of another, and uh, this one some in you know, another part of the tree is the parent of the first. And then then you create a cycle that that's not very good. So gene ontology consortium make sure it's a acyclic tree. It's a tree, and you never have the parent and child relation reversed. It's always who is more important and what's more, or which one is more general and which one is more specific. And so um, with this information, um, every gene is being annotated as, um, as three numbers. One is on the biological process, one is on the, uh, the cellular component, and one is on the molecular function. So for example, if a gene on the biological process is annotated as viral spread within host, it would mean that this gene also belongs to the viral life cycle and also belongs to the uh, biological process. So anything that this gene ontology code is, all, all of its parents are also true, okay? And so depending on how well we know about each gene, if it's a new gene, people don't know anything about it, it might be annotated by some very general terms. But if this gene has been studied by over 100 years, people know it really, really well, then it will be annotated with kind of a branch, very small branch of a very specific function, very specific process. But if it's annotated to have that specific function, all the parents' nodes annotation also belong to this gene as well, okay? So that's how the gene ontology are assigned. Every gene has three numbers. And if the, if the uh, gene is annotated as one number, all its parent trunks, those annotations also belong to this gene. Therefore, um, after we finish, uh, well, after the gene ontology consortium annotates the gene clusters, we have situations like this, which is, uh, we can look at each gene ontology term, uh, some goal term X, which is a you know, number G O one, two, three, four, five, six, is like that, that code. We ask, okay, in the whole genome, 20,000 genes, how many genes are annotated to have this particular gene ontology code? Uh, you say, okay, well, there are about 100 genes that with this gene ontology term. And then you ask, well, in this micro or in this uh, gene expression RNA seq experiment between the treatment and control, how many genes are upregulated? Um, supposedly, we have 200 genes that are upregulated, and then we ask how many of those upregulated genes have this gene ontology. If it's 80, we can calculate: is this a significant enrichment of genes belonging to this particular gene ontology terms? Okay, so. For that, we, it's a goodness of fit test. Um, and so for that, we use uh, either a yeah, chi-square test or Fisher's exact test. For example, um, we say, you know, in the whole genome, we have 20,000 genes. And in this experiment, 200 genes are upregulated. The, the remaining genes are not, diff or are not upregulated. But then if we look at how many genes in the genome are annotated with this gene ontology term is 100, but then 80 of them are upregulated, we can calculate the expected number of upregulated genes that carry this gene term. Um, and that's calculated by the total number of upregulated genes, uh, sorry, the total number of genes with that gene ontology code multiply by the total number of up genes divided by the total genes. So 100 times 200 divided by 20,000. By chance, you only expect to see one gene that's upregulated to have this gene ontology term. But what you observed is 80. It's a really, really high enrichment, right? Um, you can also calculate another term. Uh, so this 99 is calculated by 100 times you know, all the remaining not upregulated genes divided by the total gene, that's 99. And uh, this number uh, is, um, uh, if we look at, uh, yeah, it's, it's all the genes without this gene ontology code that are upregulated 
these two multiplied divided by the 20k that's 199 and so each of the numbers in the parentheses is what you expect to get by multiplying the total in the column and the total in that row and divided by the, the total genes and so with this you know two by two table that's the standard two by two table you can calculate this on a regular chi-square test uh, this is the observed <coughs> That the numbers in these four here, that's the observed, ex uh, is subtracted by the expected, which is in the parentheses, <coughs> uh, and you take the square divided by the expected, and you can check the chi-square table, that will tell you the p-value. But you can probably guess that this is a ridiculously significant p-value, right? <coughs> and so we can do this, um, by the way, if this is enriched, what you are um, report in the paper is instead of giving the gene names of 80 genes, which is very hard to spell out, you just use that gene ontology term <coughs> that's associated with this gene. So, ah, um, genes related to viral transmission are enriched in this process, enriched in this experiment. So you can use a text to describe that gene ontology term as enriched in your study rather than giving it 80 gene names. Okay, that's how you can present the differential expression in a more interesting, you know, biologically interesting way. And so question is, for this, do we need to do multiple hypothesis testing? Um, so remember, we are testing one gene ontology terms. In all the gene uh, ontology, there are 180,000 terms. We need to do this one term at a time, one term at a time, over 180,000 times. So after you calculate the differential expression, you, 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 you will get the 200 differentially expressed genes. You, you will need to do this test for all the 180,000 gene ontology terms. And each term you ask, do I see this term enriching my upregulated genes? Therefore, you yes, you do need to do multiple hypothesis testing. Okay, and then um, you you yeah, that's also by FDR. And so um, if you go to the gene ontology website, there are actually hundreds of tools for a while. I think nowadays people use a few, like such as Amigo, Gorilla, or, or Great, and uh, also David. Uh, for example, uh, David is an online tool. You can paste a number of genes in there that your that's your differentially expressed genes. Um, usually, if you have too few genes you put in there, it's not going to give you anything significant. If you have three genes, what's the chance that they're going to enrich anything? Uh, if you have a few hundred genes you input there, it will show you, oh, these genes are enriched in some pathways. But it's, in order to get that, it tests every possible gene ontology term to see which one is enriched. Um, but David also have an upper limit. It doesn't want to take more than 3,000 genes as, as your input. You, usually from a differential expression, you wouldn't expect over 3,000 genes to be different, right? And so you can use this approach to uh, figure out whether your list of a few hundred differential genes are enriching something. It will show you, a, you know, this group of pathways that they, are, they all have similar gene ontology pathways. So David automatically grouped them together and it will give you a p-value of that enrichment based on, you know, the, uh, the, the, the chi-square test. And also it will also give you a FDR, which is the multiple hypothesis corrected p-value of a pathway that's enriched. And then you want to use the FDR adjusted one to decide how to report this in your paper. Okay, so um, for today, I don't think we will have time to talk about uh, gene site enrichment analysis. So I want to do a very quick summary. Uh, basically for uh, gene expression, differential <coughs> expression, um, if you can take uh, the log of the counts, then you can basically no normalize the data. Once it's normal distributed, you can use some linear models, t-test, but you can also just use the directly on the counts and that follows a negative binomial distribution and uh, you can use DEC. And for both methods, 
they try to estimate or stabilize the variance that you measured from very few replicates by borrowing information from all the other genes. And with any type of you know, differential expression, because you're testing all the genes in the genome, we need to make sure we do multiple hypothesis testing correction. And uh, the family-wise error, uh, error rate or Bonferroni correction is too conservative. So what people use is the false discovery rate. And as we mentioned, usually you want to use something like 5% FDR using the Benjamini Hodgkin Hodgeberg approach, right, to estimate the rough number of false positives uh, based on the distribution of all the p-values. And then um, after you, you know, decided I'm going to report these 360 genes as differential, how do you really tell the readers what these genes are? You look at their gene ontology code, right? So they, each gene has a code for its molecular function, for its biological process, for its cellular component. And so you test uh, every gene ontology code to see whether your differential genes are enriched in your, in your uh, list. And uh, uh, there are tools such as David that can automatically help you do this, but there you also need to make sure you do multiple hypothesis testing correction. All right, great. That's good for now.